that's that's good. Well, good morning. Thanks for coming into the panel here. We'll be discussing uh, the Organization for Internet Safety's uh, Security Vulnerability Handling Guidelines. Uh, our esteemed panel here is all assembled. And uh, just to let everybody know up front, we, uh, we've only got about 20, 25 minutes of material to present. So we're expecting questions, and probably lots of those questions. So as we're uh, going through the initial stuff in the beginning here, uh, please make some notes of questions that you're going to have, because we're going to be very uh, interactive as we go, as we go through. Uh, just to give you a quick sense of the agenda, I'm going to go through a brief presentation here to orient everyone in case you haven't had a chance to review the guidelines yourselves. Uh, and then uh, Chris here will give a, a brief uh, sort of history of where this all came from, why it's important, why it's something that we uh, need to be considering. Uh, and uh, two, 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 panelists, and we'll go into the, uh, the full thing. Just to start, I'm Scott Blake. I'm Vice President of Information Security for Bindview Corporation. So just to set the stage, we all know about security vulnerabilities. We all know that they're uh, coming out on a very frequent uh, basis, that they are addressed to a variety of uh, uh, users and computers and so data, all sorts of wonderful things. And this is all a problem that we're very familiar with, I think, here. Uh, and it's an ongoing problem for the users, primarily, and, and administrators uh, in managing the systems and managing the vulnerabilities that are out in their, uh, out in their systems. And the costs that are associated with dealing with vulnerabilities are huge, uh, estimated to be into the billions of dollars by various sources. Uh, and we don't need to go into what those estimates are like. So obviously, the core problem is that there are vulnerabilities. We would all prefer it if the vulnerabilities could simply go away. But if we take it as a given that, the, that we're going to have them as long as we have complex software and complex hardware, then how we deal with them becomes a matter of critical importance. And uh, maybe uh, we may have some debate during the, uh, uh, when we open things up about sort of what the, uh, how, if there are ways that we can do deal with getting rid of vulnerabilities on an ongoing basis or trying to minimize the number that come out. Uh, anyway, the organization at this point has been around for a year and a half or so, uh, developing the uh, guidelines that we released to the public um, on uh, Friday, Monday, something a couple days ago. Uh, and uh, these are the, the members that are, that are currently in. Uh, most of us are represented up here on the panel today, although not all. Uh, although I think everybody has a representative here at the, uh, at the conference to some extent. We tried to balance the membership, by the way, amongst people who are performing a lot of research in security vulnerabilities, as well as people who have uh, lots of software out there that have to respond to vulnerabilities. One of the things that we tried to do is to really balance between vendors and finders of security vulnerabilities and uh, laying out what the guidelines are actually for, what they're, what they're doing. So the development process has been a, a, vulner, a voluntary uh, collaborative process uh, that we go through. And the, the, it is the, uh, the guidelines themselves specify a process that is in that same vein, uh, voluntary and collaborative in dealing with the security vulnerabilities to go forward. And as I mentioned, it applies equally to vendors and researchers. Uh, has specific pieces going through it. We'll go into some of those as we go along. Uh, but it relies upon good faith on both parties. Right? If one party is trying to take advantage of the other uh, in, uh, in resolving and getting, doing something with the security vulnerability information, then the process will fail. Uh, and we've uh, taken some steps uh, within the guidelines to uh, allow for some of those kinds of things. But the primary motivation here is really to improve the security of the internet at large and the user community of every uh, software that is going to have security vulnerabilities. Okay. And we like to point out that this is but one model. There are many ways that one can go about dealing with uh, security vulnerabilities uh, in, in both the discovery and uh, responding process. Uh, but this is one that we think is probably one going to be the most effective based on the collective experience of the organization. So the process itself can be broken down into a variety of phases. Discovery, notification, investigation, resolution, and release. Okay. Each of these have parts that go along with it. Obviously, it begins with the finder identifying the suspected vulnerability, contacting the vendor to notify that there is an issue going on here and that something needs to happen. The vendor works with the finder to develop the, to investigate the report and find out what's going on. The parties agree on what the response is going to be because there are several possibilities for how 
one might uh, reply to a, a vulnerability. And at the end, there is release, right? Which is important to note. Uh, it's uh, definitely something that I think everyone in the organization believes is a good thing, that vulnerability information needs to be out in the public and needs to be discussed uh, for a variety of reasons. So drilling into these in a little bit more detail for you. Okay. Um, the guidelines assume that the, uh, that the, the research comes up along the way that there's, that any, however it happens, the security vulnerability is discovered. It can happen by intentional investigation. It can happen accidentally. It can happen through the normal use of the software. It doesn't particularly matter, but it is incumbent on the finder of the vulnerability to do at least a minimum amount of vetting of this information to see whether it's something that somebody's already found, for example, and perhaps is already fixed. Uh, whether it is in uh, the latest patching, uh, the current versions of the software that's out, um, and preferably that there is a, a means for reproducing the problem. Uh, makes it a lot easier for everybody if, if you're able to do that. Okay. During the notification process, it's incumbent upon the vendor to provide a predictable point of contact, something that is easy for people to discover so that we don't have situations like there have been many times in the past when uh, the, ven the finder is not able to decide how to, how to notify the vendor, or they send it off to some place and it never goes anywhere. It goes into the black hole of email, and, and that's uh, the, end of, the end of the story. Uh, so we, we're trying to avoid all of those things. Uh, the, vendor, uh, the, sorry, the finder sends a uh, vulnerability summary that has some information. The vendor acknowledges that they received that. They don't just take it in and, and uh, ignore that, don't deal with the, uh, with the finder on any basis. And the parties negotiate to find an appropriate type of engagement for the process for uh, developing through, going through to release. Okay. During the investigation, most of this is done on the part of the vendor. Uh, the vendor may go back to the finder from time to time to ask for clarification or additional information if there are things that they are not able to reproduce. Uh, and so the, at the end, hopefully they're able to uh, come to an agreement about what the issue actually is and what the, uh, what the course of action is going to be. Um, and of course, the finder is always free to publish their findings if they, uh, even if they agree with the, uh, with the vendor's conclusion. But we've talked about, I'll, I'll talk in just a minute about some of the things that we have for uh, resolving conflicts within the process. Okay. Uh, during resolution, assuming the vulnerability is confirmed that it's a real issue, uh, the vendor will propose whether this goes into a maintenance release, a, fi a service pack, uh, the uh, some configuration change that may be appropriate to do, or if the patch needs to be released. Uh, some time frame goes around here. We proposed in that there is a starting point for the time frame of 30 days as a reasonable response time for the, on the part of the vendor. But there may be other, there may be many issues that come into play in how that time gets resolved. It may be longer, it may be shorter, uh, depending on the complexity uh, of what the fix that's required, the engineering realities of the software that's involved. There are a variety of factors that will go into determining just what exactly that time, uh, timeline should be. Uh, and that will, may also change during the course of the process of provisions for negotiation uh, to make sure that they are sharing information, the vendor and the finder are sharing information uh, about how the fix is proceeding. Okay. And of course, at the end, the remedy gets documented. Uh, one of the things that the guidelines uh, call for is for the documentation of the fixes, regardless of where it goes in. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware that there have been, in the past, many instances where security fixes have found their way into products without anyone actually knowing that they're there. Uh, and the guidelines propose that you should not do that, that if you have a security fix in, the so in your software, you should document that fact so that people know that it's there. Okay. Uh, and of course, we talk about a variety of other pieces of information that go about into the vulnerability report, uh, what the affected software is, the risk that it poses, what the users need to do, and any known side effects of the fix, which, as we all know, may be a significant issue as well. We also call for uh, a grace period after the availability of the fix uh, of 30 days, during which what we refer to as supplementary data is not released. That supplementary data is things that are essentially going to help the bad guys more than the good guys, uh, if we can use those terms, in which the the idea here is to essentially hold back on the technical detail of how you go about exploiting it, whether that's exploit code that actually demonstrates or the specific step-by-step -step processes that one would go through. Uh, and we'll talk, I'm sure, there'll be questions about that as we go along, so we'll, we'll del delve into that in more detail. But it's important to note that after the 30 days, there is no restriction according to the guidelines uh, of what to do with that other than a uh, encouragement to treat the information somewhat responsibly. Uh, and uh, 
what that means is obviously very much open to interpretation on the part of the parties that are involved. Okay. So we proposed this about a month ago. Initially, the draft came out. Uh, and we opened everything up for public review. We got um, hundreds of comments back from people um, ranging from you know, way to go guys to you guys suck to uh, long treatises on various pieces of the, of the process. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting for us. I think it was very educational. Some significant changes came out of the doc guidelines as a result of that public process. Uh, and the, the guidelines, we believe, are significantly improved as a result of the public comment period. Uh, and there were, there were major changes in the, in the process, primarily in the area of clarifying the context, what exactly it is that we're, we're trying to do with these, with these suggestions, uh, to reinforce the severability of the process, meaning that if there is a conflict in, during the process that the parties are able to get out of the process and still be, uh, uh, still be compliant, if you will. Uh, clarified the definition of supplementary data, as I mentioned, about technical information that's spelled out better in the document than it was originally. Um, and again, addressed some of the uh, conflict resolution sections uh, more prominently. Uh, we also differentiated between the, the minimum performance that somebody needs to have to be uh, in line with the guidelines and what we recommend for ways that one might be even, do even better of a, within, the, uh, within the context and uh, sharpened the focus of a couple of the sections. Uh, and also, one of the major comments we got back was that it was too big. <laughs> uh, the original draft was 65 pages or so, to a lot. Uh, and it, we cut it about in half, right? Just about in half? Yeah, something like that. Oh, okay, sorry, it wasn't that dramatic. <laughs> it was uh, originally about 30 pages of process, but there was a lot more stuff in there as well. Uh, and, but, and we got it down to about 25, so it's not quite that dramatic, but we did, uh, we did shorten it up uh, to make it a little bit more accessible. Okay? Uh, and we think that this is a, a th something that will work. Uh, we, we throw this out to you uh, for uh, your comments, uh, but uh, this is what we think that the process works. We think that it's necessary. Uh, we think that there is a significant amount of risk out there and that we need to take some steps to try to mitigate a lot of the risk in person from security vulnerabilities uh, that all of our customers have. Uh, we think that it's appropriate in that we take an input from pretty much everybody or everybody who wanted to give us comment um, and that it is, uh, has mutual obligations on both the, fender, the finder and the vendor, uh, that it's not one, a one-sided process that says only the vendors need to do things or only uh, the finders need to do things. We've tried to take into account both sides of the equation here. Pardon me. Uh, it works well, we think, for both large and small vendors. Uh, we have those uh, represented within the organization uh, to, to vet that uh, proposal, uh, but we, again, welcome your, your comments on these things. Uh, and also, it is self-regulating. This is a uh, process that has many opportunities within the, within the flow of the process for feedback to be given between the parties um, and to resolve conflicts that may arise. Uh, it's essentially a guideline for a collaborative discussion about the topic of security vulnerabilities. Uh, and we think that it's, uh, that it's going to work uh, in that regard. So uh, that's the end of the, uh, the presentation. Uh, the, the, that's the, the sort of factual stuff. Hopefully you've written down some questions that you're going to have for us. And uh, Chris Weisopel, who's the uh, Director of Research and Development for At Stake, uh, is going to give us a little background on how it is that we arrived at this point. Hi, good morning. Um, People, pe some people may not know that uh, before I was at at stake, I was involved in a group called The Loft and uh, went by the handle Weld Pond. And uh, back then, I'll admit it, I was a diehard, full disclosure advocate. Um, you know, no holds barred, uh, absolutist. Uh, that was probably about um, seven years ago uh, when I released my first advisory, um, including, you know, not contacting the vendor, uh, including exploit code. Um, and uh, I think, you know, being part of OIS has been, uh, my, my being part of OIS, is, I think, has brought a lot to the process as someone who actually, actually came from that world because I think that we want people to understand um, who come from the researcher diehard world, understand the process and understand some of, the, some of the, where it came from and, and, and our reasoning behind it. Um, so. The number one thing for me where o the uh, OIS guidelines came from uh, is that the environment has changed in the, in the last seven years since 
sort of the full dis or seven to ten years where the sort of the full disclosure movement started where people people back seven to ten years ago really had to take defense into their own hands completely um, there the vendors at that point weren't really uh, communicating with anyone who wasn't a wasn't a big customer and didn't have any kind of process at all to deal with security issues the way they dealt with security issues was they, they dealt with it like a like a feature request uh, where you would you would you would tell them about a problem and they you know this is without releasing any information publicly you tell them about a problem and they'd say oh that's that's a, that's a good thing we should fix and we'll fix that sort of in our next release of the product and you know they wouldn't talk to you in a year later the uh, the uh, the upgrade would come out and you'd find that your problem was you, you, the security vulnerability was fixed well we know that that is obviously not a, not a workable uh, situation um, and it, you know things things don't work that way now so that was that was the big first big change um, that that I saw um, the first big change I saw was at some point vendors started to realize that they had to take this stuff seriously and they actually had to had to res had to deal with the people who were releasing this information. I think it was around um, 1999, I actually released a, the a vulnerability in IIS, the show code vulnerability, where you could read, it was an example sample file which allowed you to read any, um, any ASP pages or any HTML on the, on, on the system anywhere. Um, and uh, after releasing that, not, not, not notifying Microsoft and giving examples, um, I got an email and they said, you know what, we've actually have a, a, you know, a security response group now and you know, if you send us the, the details, we'll fix the problem you know, and we'll fix it in a reasonable time frame. And, and this was the big fundamental shift and we can argue today what a reasonable time frame was, if, what a reasonable time frame is today or what it was then or where it should go. But a fundamental shift was there were a lot of vendors starting to say, we're going to start dealing with it dealing with these issues and we're going to um, we're going to respond now the, there really was no guidelines then but at least there was someone there answering the phone and, and talking and talking to you or answering answering the email so that, I think that was one fundamental shift that happened probably about four or five years ago with at least the bigger vendors that um, starts heading us in the direction where we can have an OIS process the uh, the other the other shift um, uh, that 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 I you know I made personally and and we did at the loft and and later at at stake was at some point we started to see that releasing the proof of concept code was doing more harm than good. I, I'm not going to stand here and say that you know there aren't people who can make great use of the proof of concept code to protect systems. There's, there's definitely there's definitely um, a good use for it. But we saw that. Our, our customers, you know, we're at stakes a consulting company, we saw our customers getting hammered on day one when an exploit was released at the same time as the, uh, as the, uh, as the bulletin and the, and the patch was, was, was issued. We saw our customers on day one, even customers who really cared about their security and were trying to patch things as quickly as, as possible, you know, trying to patch things in a day or two, they were getting owned up, you know, right away just because the exploit code was released simultaneously with the, uh, with, with the patch. And we started to say, you know, we absolutely want the field of vulnerability research to progress and people to understand how things are exploited and what are the actual details and mechanisms there, especially when it's something unique. Um, and that absolutely has to happen. But does it have to happen, you know, simultaneously? So the, these are some of the background things that, that went into. Um, first, uh, I, 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 I uh, met up with Steve Christie. He's actually, uh, I'm, I'm in the Boston area and he's in Bedford at, at MITRE. And uh, someone introduced us, um, I guess it was, uh, let's see, I guess it was February 2001, or the fall of 2001 we met. And we just started talking about, you know, CVE and, you know, at stakes disclosure policy. And we came to the conclusion, the biggest problem out there is there's no, you know, the, the, the finders, researchers have, have RF policy. Um, they're monitoring all these uh, email lists. They're, they're sort of behaving by looking at their peers. But the vendors aren't doing, aren't, aren't, aren't doing anything as far as a standardized process. Um, there's no standardized email addresses. There's no standardized you know, um, you know, expectation for you know, responding to people. And we saw that the biggest 
the biggest problem out there that needed to be solved was to get vendors involved and get and, and get a vendor process um, happening. So what we did was we just kind of went off on our own and said, Let, let's figure out what the vendors should do, or what what are vendors that are doing the right thing doing. And Steve and I wrote the um, the uh, we called it I think the responsible vulnerability disclosure um, process, which the word responsible got to be a little bit loaded there. And we we uh, we actually um, wrote this process, and then we, we went out and we, we went to um, some of the vendors which we thought were doing doing the right thing. We uh, we asked Scott to uh, comment on it. We asked Marianne Davidson from from Oracle to comment on it, and we we asked um, you know people from CERT and and some other researchers um, to comment on it, and um, and so the, the draft uh, got submitted to the IETF, and uh, that was sort of going. Uh, through that process, but in, in parallel, um, some of the vendors we got together with me and said, you know, we we want to support this 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 draft. We want we want to support that. See what, what what can we do to get other vendors and other security companies involved, and uh, started 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 gathering together, and that's kind of where OIS was formed. And then once the IETF decided, you know. This is just too contentious an issue to standardize, and you know, IETF doesn't want to standardize things that are more business process oriented. Um, IETF basically said, "We're, we're not going to deal with this," and they they just they just uh, let it expire essentially without approving it. Well, at that point, it was good that we had we had all gotten together because we had a, we had a, a, a starting point to work from, and I think the the OIS process is significantly approved from the uh, from the old. Um, Inter internet draft is a lot, a, a lot more thought ha has gone into it in, in, in presentation and actually the details. Um, so I guess that's 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 where we uh, that, that's how uh, I, I see where we came to be from. Okay, I'll just uh, introduce you to our panelists and then we will start taking questions. Um, right next to me, if you guys could stand up when I say your name. For ne right next to me, uh, Scott Culp is the senior security strategist for Microsoft. Uh, Mike O'Connor is a security coordinator, SGI. Uh, Andre Fresh is the X-Force research team lead for ISS. <clears throat> Rajiv Sinha is the manager of security compliance at Oracle. And uh, Vincent Weaver is the senior director of Symantec security response at Symantec. And I already introduced Chris. So here we are. I hope you have lots of questions in the back. Uh, I'll just repeat, repeat the question for the uh, uh, recording and, and paraphrase if I can. Um, the, the question relates to uh, the statement in the original uh, uh, guidelines that the private disclosure lists are outside the scope. And the question is whether or not the uh, guidelines that we're suggesting here have uh, additional value, create more additional value for these closed lists uh, by increasing the number of uh, 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 private information that's available through a pre-notification of the vendors. Is that a fair characterization? Okay. And the direct question is directed to the, the security companies on the list. So why don't we uh, why don't we each address that one? Uh, maybe Andre, you could start us off. If that's all right. That's on. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, we do have, as internet security systems, a uh, pre-disclosure list, uh, which is under confidentiality agreement. Uh, that basically, it's a legal framework for proprietary information. That list is set at approximately 24 hours after we notify the vendor. And that process doesn't disclose. We don't send an email message to the customer saying, uh, you know, this is the information, uh, that sort of thing. We just basically send them a tickler saying, come to our website under your confidentiality agreement and uh, basically to, uh, to come see what's there. And it's a very brief piece of information just saying this is the workaround, this is the solution, if there is one at that point, and we will be getting you more information. Um, for Symantec, actually, we don't actively look for vulnerabilities in third-party products, but occasionally, like other researchers, we will come across against them. Our model is actually to work off publicly uh, vulnerabilities, in other words, something that's gone public. Then, of course, our main priority is giving mitigation and support for our customers. Uh, we also have mailing lists such as BugTrack, uh, Security Focus Online, which we maintain as an independent entity and protect the charter integrity of that charter to make sure that things can get published. So one of the goals, of course, is making sure that information does get out in a responsible way to all the customers, including our own customers. Uh, at, at, at stake, we don't have any, any, any for pay list. Um, but that said, if we find an issue that we know one of our customers is affected by, um, we, 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 will, we will let them know under, under NDA that um, that, that they're affected, but it's it's only if we if we already know that they are. We don't like go around to all our customers that we've ever had and say you may want to look at this. It's like we already know they're exposed and we know they're vulnerable. So, and you know we just basically give them the minimum amount of information to 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 try to mitigate it. As you, as you may have guessed from the response, one of the reasons that we excluded it from the guidelines is that we don't all agree. Um, and the, the document that, that we have put out is something that we, we do all agree on. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons that we decided to stay away from that issue. Uh, just for Bindview's part, we also do not operate a pre-disclosure list. Um, and uh, actually some, some members of the OIS, not only on the, on the um, security software side, but also there are, a couple, there are people on the vendor side as well uh, who feel quite strongly that pre-disclosures are a bad idea, don't work, shouldn't be used, so on and so forth. So the, it, we, just, we just thought it was uh, better to just stay away from the issue entirely. Uh, but the, as a go, sorry, just to, the, the final point was really about whether we have something to gain from that. And that most of us don't have something to gain from that because we don't operate these lists and, and some of us don't believe in them. Okay. So that's not a major motivation here. Another question? Yeah, Adam. We have a, a, a statement rather than a question. I think we'll, we'll probably have some response to that from the, from the panel. Just to restate again for the re recording, uh, the issue is raised about uh, academic research as an important consumer of vulnerability information for the purpose of researching uh, tools and techniques to avoid creating the vulnerabilities in the first place or having the vulnerabilities have effect on the systems after the fact. Uh, and uh, the, the comment was that we should specifically encourage people 
uh, to share information, detailed information about vulnerabilities uh, with academic researchers uh, for this purpose. Is that a fair summary? Fair summary. Okay, anybody want to comment on that? I think that, that uh, I, I share exactly uh, your, your viewpoint, and I think that's why um, we don't specifically call it out, but that is one, that's the major reason why there, there is specifically in there, like after 30 days, supplementary data can be released. The whole point of that is to make sure that vulnerability research can proceed, because vulnerability researchers don't need, uh, people, people designing, doing academic research don't need stuff on day one. They just don't but they need a lot of information. So, you know, it's always been my, my standpoint, and I think a lot of the other people in the group, that we, we can't stop the flow of inter information ultimately. It's just a time-based um, stoppage. And, you know, I think your point's well taken that we, we, we should even in encourage, encourage it instead of saying oh, it's allowed. Uh, actually, it did wind up, um one of the uh, changes um, coming out of the public review um, did result in directly acknowledging the academic uh, researcher interest. I'll, I'll read you the paragraph real quick because uh, it's only been out for a day or so and you probably haven't heard it. Um, but it's in the preamble to Section 8.6 supplementary data. Um, supplementary data can aid security in certain cases, such as in the case of an intrusion detection or an antivirus vendor that uses it to develop countermeasures to the vulnerability. Likewise, it can aid academic and other institutions' research into needed engineering quality improvements. However, it can also undermine security by assisting malicious users in learning how to exploit the vulnerability. This section describes a compromise that attempts to balance these competing interests. That's really the important point, is that we, um, as, we as we talked, um, we, we came to a consensus that there are at least three parties that have um, an interest in the way this information is handled academic institutions, and some of the folks who are looking at some of the further out research to improve the engineering quality have definitely got an interest in seeing as much information as they can for exactly the reasons that you described. Um, intrusion detection, um, intrusion detection, antivirus um, folks, and vendors themselves can also benefit from the data because, for instance, if there's a vulnerability in somebody else's code base, I'd sure like to know a little bit about it so I can check my own. That also calls for more information rather than less. The balancing interest is the user interest, and we believe it predominates early in the process. So that 30-day grace period was an attempt to try to balance out those competing interests in a way that lets everybody have what they need when they need it. A couple other things. Uh, in a closed source context, that's not necessarily the easiest thing you know, after 30 days. Show us the lines of source that were wrong and what you did to fix them, one. Two, uh, with the academics, um, I will say that about half the time we get an academic request, that's some, some student that wants to break into their professor's computers. So we do, I mean, we, we do get legitimate requests, but that's sometimes not necessarily the easiest thing for us as a vendor to figure out. I think just the final point on this is something that you alluded to, which is the number one responsibility of the vendor is obviously creating secure software in the first place. We acknowledge that. I think what we're really doing with this process is saying the reality is we are getting new vulnerabilities. Last year, about 50 new vulnerabilities reported per week. This year, we're on track for about 70 new publicly reported vulnerabilities. So the goal was to how to create a process around that to be able to handle it.
Got it? Okay. Just to restate the questions again, and uh, we'll take them, we'll just answer them one, one at a time. First question um, is uh, the 30-day grace period allows for the release of, during the 30-day grace period, you can release information to uh, supplementary data to uh, specifically noted uh, critical infrastructure uh, folks, people who have responsibility for protecting critical infrastructure. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we know who those people are? Um, what's the justification for allowing people to do that? Let's just, we'll just take them one at a time. First question. Yeah, I, I think there's a little misconception there because you said, you know, you're leaving other people unprotected. This 30-day grace period is the patch is available, information about concerning the issue at a high level and, you know, any kind of workarounds, mitigating steps you can take are available. The supplementary data is in addition to that. So it's, it's not a situation where people are left unprotected. They can install the patch or perhaps do some, some sort of work around. But I, I, you know, I think your point is well taken. Who, who, are these, who are these people who have this, you know, special, special access? And that, that's, that's, I don't know if we have a good definition for that. Speaking on behalf of Oracle, we do not provide a heads up or a pre-notification to anybody. So we do not have a special A list or B list or C list. We just do not. We work with the, with the finder, whoever that person or persons or entities may be, and only those people. And we, tr we try to make it such that we work with them cohesively so that we can provide the best solution. But we do not pre-alert anybody. Uh, yeah, just to drill in a little bit on uh, what Chris was saying, um, the, the, uh, the guidelines deliberately don't identify a group of people, you know, by name, who should get the information. It's identified by class. During the 30 days, people who are, who are associated with protecting the infrastructure, um, you know, building the, um, the systems that, that protect networks and so on, are appropriate folks with whom to share that data. There's a, there's a real legitimate need to share that data. The guidelines don't say who those people are. It's up to each person who's um, working within the process to, to, you know, to identify and decide who the information is going to be shared with. Now, you may have to defend that choice in the court of public opinion, but there isn't any place in, this guide, in these guidelines where it says, for instance, these companies or these organizations can get the information and others can't. You know, they're, they're, they're behavioral guidelines. They're not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a hard-coded list. One thing about critical infrastructure is there's um, critical infrastructure for the, for the delivery of the fixes themselves. Uh, one, uh, there are some folks who like to, you know, who think of the critical infrastructure as the set of sites besides us that needs to be up in order for us to, when we release a fix, actually, you know, get the fix to the people. So there's not just critical infrastructure is left undefined, but that's one definition that some big vendors have used. Uh, speaking from a point from ISS and how ISS handles uh, supplementary information as it's defined by OIS, um, ISS is very conservative in terms of who it hands that information to. We often get requests after the fact uh, from people. We don't authenticate them because we don't honor those requests. We tell them we regret we can't f fulfill those. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, of course, we do provide any exploit or co proof of concept information that we have to the affected vendors. Uh, even in those cases where you were sending it one-to-one, uh, -one, there have been instances where things have sometimes gotten out of hand, but that's very rare. We also provide it to law enforcement agencies on, um, uh, on request. In the past, we provided it to groups like NIPSI and uh, to the DHS. And uh, like I said, basically, we're extremely conservative about who we send that supplementary information to. Uh, I'd just like to, to add to that briefly, uh, that, the, that this is a may in the guidelines, not a shall. Right? So it, it's saying you can share the information with critical infrastructure, for example, but other, you know, others who may have a legitimate need to have the information ahead of time. Um, and I, uh, bind you is with Oracle on this one. We don't, we don't share information with anybody no matter what. So it, when it comes to public, it's public. Uh, the next question that you had asked uh, was relating to uh, eliminating the, the, the pressures of full disclosure. Uh, and whether if the vendors no longer have uh, the uh, sort of Damocles hanging over them, if you will, 
uh, threatening for the public release, uh, will they continue to do the right thing? Uh, and uh, that, I'll throw that out to the, to the panel. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, I think that's a good question. I think it's an open question, and I think that um, there's a chance that vendors are just going to not do the right thing. They're going to game the process, and they're going to say, oh, okay, now I can delay this seven days, I can delay this 30 days, and I'm just going to try to delay the process. And if that's what's going on, the environment has changed from what it is today. And the OIS uh, um, guidelines are meant to be a living document that we've stated we are going to revisit in, is it six months? Um, and, and to revisit them, and you know, if things aren't working, you know, we want, we, want it, we want to fix it. So this is an opportunity to see if, if the, this type of process can work. If it can't work, we got to do something else. But I, I, I think to just say it's not going to work without trying it is just, just staying, you know, the way we were eight years ago and nothing can ever improve. The idea behind these guidelines is if we can improve it, let, let's try. I, I would add to that myself also that the so the stick of full disclosure has worked. Most vendors are now responsive and doing all the things that we want them to do. And it's, I think it's time that the research community recognizes that and cuts them a little slack to see if we can do better overall. And if it, if it doesn't happen, then as Chris mentioned, the, the guidelines will be revisited. And if people are gaming the process, then there's all, there are mechanisms in, within the process for uh, dealing with that as well. If the, if the parties aren't acting in good faith, one, or, one of them can pull out of the process. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I think one thing Chris said earlier is, in the beginning, it was the chaos surrounding the lack of process that caused a lot of things to go public unnecessarily, where researchers had no idea who to talk to. They may talk to tech support, they may talk to somebody else in the company. It didn't flow up correctly. So part of the goal of this process is to say, here's best practice, here's what can work. If you've got a company who's trying to hide behind lack of process or process, they will continue to do this. But for those who are really trying to achieve the right thing for their customers, here's some guidelines they can use. Uh, we are always under pressure to get the fix out in a responsible time frame. One of the reasons that we, that we do not allow the, this pressure to dwindle is because we deploy our own products. If we just sit on any vulnerability, our own systems, our own company, Oracle, is vulnerable. So we work with the finder, and believe me, I haven't come across a single, single finder who does not give me uh, some amount of pressure to get it fixed. And, and at the same time, uh, we, we realize that if we do not take proactive measures to actually get the problem rectified in the best possible manner, our own global IT folks, much, much to their chagrin, will, will also say, by the way, what are you doing? So we are always under that pressure. But while getting a patch out or a patch set or a service pack or a anything like that, there are some, there are some constraints within which uh, companies like Oracle work. It is not simply fixing one issue in one place. There is a lot of testing, a lot of system testing, a lot of product and interdependency testing that has to take place. And obviously, we work with the finder to make sure that things, uh, time frame is re reasonable, keeping in mind that at the same time, while we're discussing with the, with the finder and fixing the problem, that our systems are vulnerable to that date. One last... Oh. One maybe not last thing, but um, one thing is is that if you if you happen to be a smaller company who's struggling and you have a choice between someone who's trying to do proactive research, you know, between having someone do proactive research and having someone react to the emergency of the week or day or minute or month that happens to come, uh, it gets, you know, being able to have, you know, being able to at least have some balance between. So that way, not everything runs in emergency. Everything, if everything comes in emergency mode, it's going to take more resources. That's just a fact um, than if you do a little bit of upfront work. So if you're trying to go balance resources, having something that's a little, you know, having a process that does not involve everything in the universe being an escalation helps. Um, ISS is both on both sides of the issue as both a um, software manufacturer and as a researcher, we've actually been in the situation, both, uh, both cases, of uh, full disclosure working for and against us. We've had vendors in the past 
that have said, uh, especially when we were a lot smaller and nobody really knew about disclosure, they're just like, oh, you're just you know, a bunch of flakes, go away and, and leave our product alone. And we have disclosed in that case. Um, it was an issue, I think it was back in around 97 or 98 where that happened. Uh, on the other side of things, there have also been cases where we've gotten possibly a, uh, a bug report sent to sales at ISS.net or to uh, you know, John Doe or something like that where we didn't really say this is where you need to send these things or somebody wasn't aware and then we read about the bug in, in a public disclosure forum. Um, the reason that we uh, work with, I, or with OIS and, and put together this procedure is so that we do have some place where we can say, okay, well this is how it needs to be done, this is how we're going to do it and, and work from there. From the vendor perspective, um, these guidelines don't let us off the hook, uh, far from it. They actually increase the pressure on us, and I'll tell you how. Today, if a vendor wants to really game the system, they can play all kinds of games. They can say, for instance, well, you, know, you, you sent the report to the wrong place. Okay, we got it, we were going to answer it, we just hadn't answered it yet. You're being really unreasonable in, in going public at, you know, at this time. Okay, we, we engaged you, we were building it. We didn't give you status updates very often, but you didn't ask us for them either. You, you, can, play that, you, you, can, you can play that game if you want to um, today. By signing on and saying we're gonna follow this, if you send that report in to the, to the address that, that, that we said you should send it to, and we don't respond, there's a timetable. You can, you can take us to town. If we don't give you regular updates, there's a process for, for, for saying I'm going to withdraw from the process altogether and you, can, and you can go ahead and exit. Once you do that, you sort of submit, you know, you, you, you submit the facts, you say, you know, the vendor didn't do X, which they were clearly obligated to do by the guidelines that they said they were going to follow. What's the vendor's response? The only response is, gosh, I'm really sorry, we'll do better next time. That's going to increase the pressure on the vendors. This is this is absolutely um, this is absolutely a a, um, um, a good thing for finders, and it and it, it does involve the vendors standing up and uh, taking responsibility for you know for fulfilling their obligations. I I'd also like to address one more issue that you'd brought up and. Uh, Give me Scott if I'm jumping ahead here. Um, you, you, you brought up a point of how do you identify the finder? I'm not sure if you're going to answer that. How, how, how do you identify the finder? Is, it, is this person or entity you know, one of the good guys or bad guys, if I may use those terms? That's a very interesting uh, question. And one of the first things we do at Oracle is we, we try to get a feel for who the person is or that entity is. And uh, one of the things I personally ask is, well, what's your motivation for finding a potential security issue in our, in our software. Are we on the same side of the line? And what I mean by that is, uh, is your customer, therefore my customer, paying you to do security research at their firm, and therefore you're bringing it to us? If so, we're on the same side of the line here. Or are you doing this out of the goodness of your heart? I think it's the former. But that is an excellent question. And it's something that we have to deal with on a daily basis, because we get a number of emails in our Oracle Security Alert Channel and to figure out the good things from the lot of junk that we get in there. It's, it's an interesting and time-consuming issue. The uh, last question that you asked was the, when the, by having the uh, vendors get notified before public release, does this increase uh, the potential for uh, tech support revenue? What is, what is, where does this leave uh, customers who are not on support contracts? Uh, will they get left out, in the, left out in the cold somewhere along the line? Uh, the, the, the guidelines basically say that the vendor needs to publish a bulletin and a patch to resolve the issue. And um, I'm not sure if it's in the guidelines whether this has to be free and pu publicly available or not. I think it says publicly available. So, I mean, that's, I have a, I have a, I have a uh, you know, a, a, str a strong opinion on this that people shouldn't have to pay to have their software um, fixed uh, for a security vulnerability, and um, if it, I, I think it, I think it is in there that they have to publicly, you know, state the problem. But the fact of the matter is, you know, different companies have different business models as far as support goes, 
And um, I, I think that the, the fact that some vendors have certain business models that require, th this is part of, the, part of the revenue comes from the support, support um, I think the OIS guidelines leave, leave, the, leave it open whether you, know, you have to pay, pay, for, pay for the patch or not. But I, I, I would say that you know, I, I definitely encourage people to not have to pay, but you know, that's not my decision to be made. Someone who bought the software knew the support they were getting. Uh, next question, yes. Uh, to paraphrase the question, uh, the, uh, we, we all recognize that there are vulnerabilities that, are, that do not go public and are not reported to the vendor, right? Uh, and so the, the question to the panel is, uh, how do we feel about uh, bug hunt programs such as that done by uh, Netscape, uh, that, but other in incentives to, from the vendor to the finder to actually bring that information in? Is that a fair? Yeah. Anyone want to take that? Somebody has to take it. Um, the, uh, the bug hunt programs that I'm familiar with have, have all pretty much been failures. Um, the reason is because they are so, so difficult to administer. Um, how do you decide what is a bug, what isn't a bug? If two people bring in something that are two bugs that are really, really close, do they each get the prize or only one? If a guy submits the, you know, you know bug A you know, on day one and then bug A.1 on day two and A.2 on you know, the next day and so on, does he get the prize every time? The administration of those things is just awful. And I think that's why most of the bug hunt um, programs that have been sponsored have been failures. The way we look at it at Microsoft is this. Um, there's a difference between directed and undirected research. And we do work with a lot of third parties to do directed research. And what happens in these cases is, for instance, we'll say, you know, we've done a, a, a really thorough scrub on a new product that's coming out, but we want to get an independent look at it, a third set of eyes, you know, some, somebody else um, who hasn't been part of the development process, we want to get an independent look. We'll go out and we'll contract for that, and we'll, you know, of course, we'll, we'll pay for it, and, and so on and so forth. It's a little different situation when somebody shows up and says, here's a, here's a bug I found. That's undirected research. And we, we don't typically pay for, we, we, don't, uh, we don't pay for undirected research. In some cases, that's a way of establishing a relationship and establishing one's bona fides. And sometimes that does lead to a relationship down the road where you can do directed research. But I would be very, very leery as a vendor of ever signing on to a, um, uh, a scenario in which I would say, yeah, bring in bugs and we'll pay you X number of dollars for each one because the, you know, the, the uh, programs like that have typically um, deteriorated into a, into a hash fairly quickly. The question is that whether we would acknowledge that there are uh, vulnerabilities that will never be seen in the public by, or seen by the vendor if they're without a, some kind of a program that, that compensates the people who find the, find the bug. I think I would respond to that, that there are going to be bu uh, vulnerabilities that are never seen by the vendor, period. Uh, regardless of whether they have a program like that, I mean, there are going to be people who decide that they don't want to give it into the vendor under any circumstances because they want to use it for their own, their own gain. Um, and there are, I will also point out, a couple of companies out there now that are purchasing publication rights for vulnerability information. Uh, that they, they are doing, they are paying people for their, for their research uh, and then doing whatever they want with that information, which at this point is notifying the vendor and notifying their customers. Uh, but that's, you know, that, can, that can go in any, any direction that it wants to go. So, uh, next question. Yes.
the, the question is, is there any intent on the part of the organization um, to resolve the issue of whether or not people should pay for security issues, or is it just too much of a hot potato? I can give you the Microsoft answer. We don't charge for security patches, we don't charge for service packs, and we never will. The, uh, I think that the, the answer to your question is no, there is no intent to deal with that issue. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit kind of outside the scope. Um, we, we can certainly, the, mo the most we could ever do is, really, is to recommend, um, because that's all any of the stuff, the stuff that we put out is, is recommendations. Um, and uh, I think if it's, uh, it, was it raised in the public comment period? Do you, did you guys deal with that? I don't, I don't think that it was particularly raised during the public comment period in this round, but we'll do it again. Uh, so I would encourage you to raise it as an issue and we'll, we'll definitely take it up at that oh, point. For, yeah. Yeah. For, for people who charge, um, the specter of, pro of product liability law uh, looms. We could leave it, leave it at that. Yes, in the back. Just for the, uh, the recording, the comment is about uh, work that was uh, published during the vulnerability database workshops held at Sirius a uh, year or two ago. Uh, that uh, was there was work done on motivations of people in finding and fixing security vulnerabilities, uh, and that the uh, the guidelines would probably benefit from reference to some of that information. And we'll take that under advisement. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Yeah, the question is uh, that we have a, the model has uh, a separate vendor and finder. Uh, what are the effects on the model if the uh, finder is also a vendor in their own right? Not, not a vendor who is affected by that vulnerability, but a vendor who has something to gain by knowledge of the vulnerability. Is that a fair summary? Um, yeah, and I, I'll just point out that, that all of the security researcher representatives here that are on the organization have some level of software offering at, at, and have some some kind of business interest in, in having access to vulnerability information. So uh, it's a fair question. Anybody want to take it? I'll start. Um, there have been several instances where that has happened. Probably the earliest one I remember was where we had found a vulnerability in a Cisco product. And uh, it was a really juicy thing back then to get something in a competitor. And this was actually before many of the security vendors were talking to each other. And uh, ISS as uh, as their guidelines, as their policy, uh, do, treats a competitor just like we treat a, uh, a software vendor. We sent that information to Cisco, uh, Cisco produced a patch, and then we coordinated on when to release that. Uh, there have been several cases since where that has happened, either that we found something at a competitor's product or uh, by the public research where we uh, saw something out there in, in the public disclosure forums. And in each one of those cases, we've never made a jump on a on a, a, a competitor. Yeah, I think to echo that, there's actually a very close relationship and a lot of respect among the security companies, among ourselves, where we will work together. But the bottom line is you'll treat the process exactly as you would any other vendor. You will do disclosure, you will follow best practices. At the end of the day, the information will go public. You won't give them more time or less time, you'll work with them. 
However, typically, because they're both researchers and vendors, they're often faster to work with the process, they're more experienced, so typically these things tend to work out a lot faster with other people who are researchers and vendors together. I would also add that in terms of sort of business gain, um, it's, uh, it's pretty questionable to begin with if, uh, on being on the finder side of things. I mean, the, unless you're actually selling the information, which there are companies that do, although not, uh, me, not at my company, um, then there's not a lot of difference other than, uh, for example, if find you find something, we make vulnerability software, vulnerability assessment software. So we'll develop a check at the same time that we're working with the vendor to the, for them to develop a, a fix, and we'll release our, our check at the same time that, we, that the information goes public, but not before. Uh, and the, the only issue that really arises in the guidelines is the possibility of, of pre-disclosure notification. Um, which is, goes to that, that other issue which we've sort of bracketed and don't really, don't really deal with. The pre-release uh, of information is, is something that, that we don't necessarily agree on. Um, and so the, the guidelines make uh, allowances for in releasing supplementary data during the, uh, during the 30 day grace period, uh, but they make no provisions for releasing the pre-fix information to somebody else. Right, uh, and that's uh, it's sort of outside the scope. I don't, I don't think we, we don't specifically prohibit it, do we? I don't think it, it's it's not really mentioned as whether is something that that either can or can't be done. But I think that's really where your question is going. Is that right? Yeah, and it, it, it's outside the scope, unfortunately. Uh, it's something that we could we could probably debate at length. <laughs> one one thing I'll say um, is. A lot of the examples are given were in the context of one security vendor versus another security vendor, potentially. Uh, a lot of the idea behind OIS in general is this is a policy for people who don't have really strong policies. Like what if one CAD vendor finds a security vulnerability against another CAD vendor and their motivation may be, well, gee, this is a sales, this is a thing I can do to sell my product. Um, that's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, the scope here exists beyond how security companies interoperate with other security companies and with vendors. Next question? Yeah. The, the question is what obligations do participants uh, within the process have to other participants within the process to, to follow the guidelines and what would, for example, what would happen if there was a conflict where um, company A had a relationship with company B that does follow the process but has a relationship with company C that does not and doesn't want his business partners to follow it either, right? Is that a fair? Yeah. I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> that was going to fall on me. Uh, the, the process in the guidelines are entirely voluntary. Um, and so a company that has, for whatever reason, whatever, whether that's a business reason or any reason whatsoever, doesn't want to follow them, doesn't have to. Okay? If there are places where they might follow some or all of the process at different times, what the guidelines suggest is that the, you publish a policy that tells, that tells what's good, what the story is so that you have predictability on the part of the people that you're going to interact with. So for example, if there are some pieces of the process that you can't do or won't do, that's fine. It's only requested that you document those and make them available so that people understand that you're not going to be following those parts of the process. And also, if you're not able to use it in relation to certain kinds of information, for example, say we're, we're OEMing a product from another company, right? a software product from another company, that other company doesn't want to have anything to do with the guidelines then we need to say for our product that we're, that we're you know, OEMing, we're not able to follow the process for this product, but we will follow it for our other products, perhaps, is a one way in that which that might spin out. Does that answer your question? More or less? OK. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, wait, the, the comment was that there seems to be a lack of, a, lack of accountability there. Uh, this is not regulation, right? It's one of the things that we've that this came by many times during the public comments is that there is there is no accountability, and, and we openly acknowledge that there is no accountability, except insofar 
as the court of public opinion may have may want to weigh in. Just one follow-up to that. I think one of the things we have found is we get comments back from companies or from people saying, um, my company doesn't allow me to do this, or my legal department, my PR department, my sales department, whatever. And one of the things we have found that works very well is the informal links of saying, let me introduce you to somebody in our department who can allay your fears. This is why uh, public disclosure is a good thing. So building up the informal context has been very effective of being able to break down those barriers to companies who say, I can't do it for whatever reason. And usually it's because of somebody else inside the company. So education is a big part of this too. And I, I, if we could just take one last question because we're just about out of time and then we'll, we'll have to be a, a quick one. Uh, yes, sir. The question is about uh, extending the process to include patch management, which if I can sort of recast that into sort of our, the process terms, uh, is to extend the process beyond the release of the fix, right? The process as it stands now stops when, when the fix is available and the grace period expires and then that's, that's the end, right? The, the security vulnerability is reported and responded to on the part of the finder or the vendor. Do we have any aspirations to expand into now the, the users have the fix information, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. Let's, we're, we got two minutes. Let's get the, excuse you guys. Anyone want to take this one? Go ahead. I, I think that's, uh, on. Sorry. Um, I think that's an excellent question. Maybe something that we might take up. But I think the responsibility really lies with the vendor. Uh, from Oracle's perspective, we have on-site management teams at most company uh, at most of our customers. It is our responsibility to make sure that we get our customers to apply the patch in the right and responsible manner. That is, that is, at, that is in my opinion, very unique to most companies. I know Microsoft's model is different from ours, and I think most of ours are different. But it is something that, yes, you're right, is a pervasive problem in the industry, how to get patches done right, because I, we patch our own systems too, and our IT folks constantly complain uh, I'm sure yours do. So yes, that's a fantastic question, and we may address it uh, in our discussions going forward. Uh, so speaking from OIS, there were several cases where we started venturing into uh, issues of sort of an internal company process. Uh, one of the examples was in how to do testing, how to do internal testing. And what we had found, at least with the time frame that we had and the expertise that we had in the group, was that that was very problematic because uh, not that all companies say, I've got to do this differently or anything, but everybody's got a different evolution as to how they've uh, done their patch management. Some uh, just say, uh, put these lines in the code. Some have got a utility. Some have got a, an entire process built around it. And, and we felt that it was very difficult uh, to say to people, this is how you should do it because most people had already had that set up. One quick note. For every person who said the OIS draft ought to be shorter, there was one person who was maybe the same person who said, but you should talk about all these other things too, okay? Just, just so you know, there, there are many competing forces at work. And if I can take the liberty of having the last word on it, the, the only, uh, the, the, the one major issue I think in it, for us to deal with that would be that it's a different constituency, right? In the, in the existing process, we're talking about the finder and the vendor of the security issue and how they interact with each other. And the users are sort of in the background, if you will, as, as the people that we're doing this for, but not necessarily, they don't participate in the process. And then, it, so when we then were to extend, we would need to add a whole nother constituency to do it. And I think it's, I think it's something that probably uh, needs to be done, that, it's, that, there's a, that there's a need for this to, to get out there and for patch management to become a, an issue around which we might be able to standardize some processes on. Uh, but I think it's going to be outside our scope and maybe it'll be the next, the next organizational or possibly some of the same, same players involved. Okay. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. We're, uh, we're out of time. I appreciate your uh, active participation in asking lots of questions. Thanks. <laughs>